Hey folks! Today we are going to talk about all of the books that I read in March. Or I suppose it would be closer to say all of the books that I started reading in March and then just didn't actually finish. <laughs> That's probably more accurate. So, join me as I talk about the three books that I actually did read and the stack of books that I um, barely touched, I suppose. Grab your own adult sippy cup and let's get into it. So I ended up getting into a pretty bad reading slump uh, that started in February and continued on through March. So, uh, yeah. So I'm still continuing my buddy read of Don Quixote with Miguel de Cervantes. I'm doing buddy read with Graz over the GKBC. We're still doing that. Although admittedly I'm a bit behind and need to catch up. But some reading was done in that eventually. <laughs> uh, then what else did I pick up? I picked up The Ever Cruel Kingdom, which is by Rin Chipeko. It is a sequel to The Never Tilting World. I read two chapters in it set it aside. I decided I needed a comfort read. Started Northanger Abbey, got two or three chapters in, set that aside. Read another chapter or so in Count of Monte Cristo, set that aside. Started reading one of Nellie Bly's books, the uh, Around the World in 72 Days, got two chapters in, set that aside. Started reading A Duke by Default by Alyssa Cole. Again, a couple chapters in. Set that aside. That, uh, that was that month pretty much. I also started Poems by Len Penny. Set that aside, although it's now April. Full disclosure, I did just finish reading that last night, so. <laughs> Yay. What else did I get through? Went on mini vacay. <laughs> uh, started abroad in Japan. I uh, got, how many chapters did I get into this? I got more than a couple. I got seven chapters into this. Set that aside. <laughs> I started reading Fellowship of the Ring by Tolkien. Um, actually, this is one that I'm actively reading. I'm still actively reading it. I'm almost done with it. Really enjoying that, but again, did not finish that in March either. Uh, and that pretty much continued. Uh, I also started Time Cat by Lloyd Alexander. Again, how many chapters? Six chapters in this one. Set that aside. <sighs> yeah, that was, that was my reading slump, guys. It has been tough um, reading, to be completely honest. I spent a lot of March binging shows. That is mostly what I did. I I finished watching Keeping Up Appearances, which is in Brickholm from like the 80s, 90s that I really like. Um, finished my rewatch of that. Started Are You Being Served, which is another Brickholm that I really enjoy. <laughs> uh, watched the Monty Python. Uh, Rewatched one of my comfort anime, which is Bunny Drop. Do not read the manga. Watch the anime, it's very cute. Um, we watched that entire thing, it's only 11 episodes, so it's not really that long. I started some others, I started Great British Bake Off over again. Binged almost the entire thing. <laughs> okay, what else did I do? Poirot, I watched a lot of uh, Agatha Christie's Poirot with David Suchet as the titular detective. Also started another anime called The Way of the House Husband, which is fantastic, by the way. It's really hilarious. It is about a former Yakuza boss who, after a particular incident, leaves the life, uh, tries to go on the up and up, I guess, meets um, the woman who become would become his wife, and he ends up being a house husband because his wife is like a career woman, and he basically applies his old skills to household things like 
the language around getting spots out of things, preparing a dinner because the boss is coming over, like all this kind of like situations. He still looks and sounds like he's in the Yakuza, but he's just focused on being the best house husband, basic. It's hilarious. Um, yeah, that's mostly what I spent my time doing was watching and uh, not finishing a bunch of books. But I did manage to finish three because I was reading Time Cat um, and liking it, but not liking it as much as some of Lloyd Alexander's other books that I've read, I decided, you know what, I'm in the mood to do a reread of The Chronicles of Perdain. So I did indeed read The Book of Three, which is the first book in the series, and this is following uh, Taryn, who is a young boy, um, Taryn of Car Carrot Dalbin. He has lived the majority of his life at Carrot Dalbin with Dalbin the wizard, and also Cole who is uh, a blacksmith but used to be a warrior. Taryn, besides learning things here and there um, and helping out with stuff around the, the farm and the blacksmithing and all that kind of thing, he also is assistant pig keeper. He is in charge of keeping track of the white uh, oracular pig, Henwin. Uh, Henwin yeah, with these, like, sticks can predict uh, things. She can tell the future. She's an oracular pick. And unfortunately, rumors have come that the Horned King, this evil guy, that guy, basically, uh, who is a servant of King Arwan. Am I pronouncing it right? Arwan. Probably not pronouncing it right. A lot of it is belt based off of Welsh legends, and I don't speak Welsh, so I'm gonna fuck up some pronunciations, I'm sure, but King Aron, who is like this king of the underworld, kind of like darkness thing, is like gathering forces, and the Horn King is one of his servants, and he's searching for Henwin, uh, the pig, and Henwin senses this and flees. And Taran, because he's responsible for Henwin, is like, oh shit, I have to go find this pig or I'm gonna get in trouble. And terrible things are going to happen, so he ends up going off on this search for Henwin. And meets uh, some other characters going on this great big adventure. And I really love this book. Uh, I remember the first time I read it, I wasn't completely... I wasn't too fond of most of the characters. I found Taran to be annoying... Princess Alanwi, also annoying. Like, I, I was just kind of fed up with most of the characters except for Henwin the Pig. And then you come to Flutterflam the Bard, who is absolutely fantastic. I adore Flutterflam. He is 100% my favorite character in the entire series. He is ridiculous, and he is also known for telling tall tales, exaggerating feats and things. Uh, somewhat, and his beautiful magical harp, uh, its strings tend to break every time he tells a lie that's just a little bit too big. Uh, so it's trying to keep him honest, basically. This is such a great story. It's fast-paced. It's not that thick of a book, really, but it's pretty fast-paced. Um, even when it's a lot of traveling and stuff, stuff is happening. There's also... A lot of, I think, really fantastic uh, thoughts in here, really fantastic lines. Just has some really great, beautiful lines in it. Uh, there is, I guess, a problem with a lot of the <laughs> characters, in my opinion. Uh, info dumping, like certain characters kind of info dump. But I guess that might have been the style with fantasy at the time. Like, info dumping is 100% a Tolkien thing. There's a lot of info dumps in here by characters. It's, and it strikes me as especially funny when things are so urgent. And they're like, we gotta get through this quickly. But here, I'm gonna give you four paragraphs of me explaining things in great detail. But we really need to be on the run. And it's just, it's kind of funny. Um, and that's true in here, too. There is a little bit of info dumping, especially uh, from Lord Gwydion, basically. But 
Gwydion also has a, says a lot of the coolest lines in here. For example, he reveals himself as a lord, as a prince, basically, and Tauren is now like, oh, oh boy. Um, and is like, I'm so sorry, I didn't intend insolence on your part because he's like, the guy's dressed in dirty travel clothes and very simply dressed and everything. And Gwydion says, it is not the trappings that make the prince, nor indeed the sword that makes the warrior. I was like, that's... That's really cool. That's really good. And the, the, this book, the series, is kind of chock full of lines like that. They're really like kind of cool and wise and beautiful or sometimes profound. And that's something that I really enjoy about this series. But yeah, so I read that. Really loved it. I had this originally marked as four stars and I just kind of left it as that score because that's pretty much still how I felt about it. It's four stars. And Speaking of books I set aside, uh, I started book two, The Black Cauldron, got how many chapters in? Chapter five, five chapters in. Again, set it aside. <laughs> I do hope to get back to those books sometime this month. At least I really want to finish my reread of that series because I really do love it um, a lot. Uh, then... I did manage to finally finish reading The Hidden Oracle by Rick Riordan. This is book one in the Trials of the of Apollo series. And I say finally like it was an accomplishment because it kind of felt like one. I love uh, Riordan's writing, don't get me wrong. I just recently talked about him in my top 10 favorite authors video. Like I, I do 100% really love his writing. But Apollo is just so insufferable that it's just honestly really hard to get through these because of how annoying Apollo is, and Apollo is unfortunately uh, the narrator of the series. Like, the series is from his POV, so I I finished reading this. Um, I liked it, as you can see. There are, some, there are some pages that I turned down because some of the lines were actually struck me as, like, funny or really cool, and I did really enjoy it. I I think I liked it most seeing familiar faces. There were a lot of new people that I didn't know or maybe they were characters that were mentioned in like the Heroes of Olympus series but it's been a little bit since I read it and they didn't make a huge impression on me so I probably forgot their names and who they were and stuff like that but I did like seeing familiar faces again. We see Percy for a hot second. Uh, what this is about is Apollo has first circumstances. He basically has become mortal and he is tasked with basically proving himself of not being a giant shithead in the hopes of pleasing Zeus so Zeus will give him his immortality back. That's basically what this is. So he is currently mortal in the form of a 16 or 17 year old boy named Lester Papadopoulos. That's his ID and visage right now. Uh, so yeah, that's basically what he is up to and he ends up at Camp Half-Blood because that's the most safest place for him. And so you see a lot of familiar faces there. You see um, Chiron, you see uh, you know, a bunch, a bunch of other people. And of course, at the same time, evil is happening. Evil is lurking. The big baddies are trying to do a come, make a comeback and Apollo is going to have to like, you know, get it together and do something. So see a lot of familiar faces. Loved it at Camp Half-Blood because you get to see Nico and I absolutely, Nico and Percy, I know I've talked about this before, they are my two favorite characters in the entire series. Um, my third favorite character being Leo Valdez. And yeah, so I was very jazzed to see a little bit more of Nico, see a little bit of Will, see a little bit of like other characters that I love at the end of the book. A couple more characters show up and I got so jazzed. And I really thought that, that was going to propel me into book two, which is The Dark Prophecy. And I looked at the first couple of pages and then I, again, set it aside. Um, but I am hoping to 
because currently I am very much in the mood for fantasy, I'm hoping that I can continue this through and then I will shove my way through the rest of the series because I really, really want to plow my way through the series because I really want to read the Percy Jackson number six and then also The Sun and the Star, which is about Nico and Will. So, um, but you have to read this first because there's spoilers. So, uh, thoughts on The Trials of Apollo? <laughs> I think that, I mean, it's still a Roy Orden book, it's still in the, this particular universe, it's still a lot of fun, there's funny things happening, I love seeing uh, familiar faces, I really liked uh, revisiting certain characters and things like that, I, I did enjoy certain elements of it. Again, Apollo is so freaking insufferable, he's so full of himself, he's so annoying, and it's just really hard to read from his point of view, which is why if it weren't for the fact that he started slowly getting like less insufferable over the course of the book, and mind you, he's still just so much. He has so much to deal with. Um, but he, he started to lose some of that annoyingness just by a teensy bit. And also just because there's so much humor and a lot of action and there was a twist that I was sort of expecting but not exactly which I liked so my rating for this was like four stars um if we hadn't have had those fun bits and him slightly redeeming himself just just a teensy bit this probably would have been a three star because he's so annoying I just cannot abide by him so frustrating but I guess it's I mean, kudos to Ray Orden because he's written pretty, like, quirky, lovable, endearing characters, and then he manages to write this shithead. <laughs> so, I mean, props to him for his writing skills, I guess. If you want an idea of how annoying Apollo is, we can just look at the back of the book. Um, let me see. Apollo on demigods. Gods always like to keep a few strong veterans handy to throw into battle, send on dangerous quests, or pick the lind off our togas. Uh, Apollo on the human body. I will never understand how you mortals tolerate it. You live your entire life trapped in a sack of meat, unable to enjoy simple pleasures like changing into a hummingbird or dissolving into pure light. Apollo's daily motivational speech. You are gorgeous and people love you. I feel like that's a prime example of how absolutely annoying he is. I hate characters like that, to be honest. Yeah, he's a lot, but I mean, I got through it. Um, like I said, I'm hoping to plow through the rest of the series. Hopefully, if I can stomach him, like I said, by the end of the book, he'd started to slightly redeem himself a little bit, so I'm hoping that that continues and there's actual, like, character growth. That would be nice, but I mean, he's a god in the Percy universe. It's him learning a lesson is unlikely, to be completely honest. Uh, and then the last book that I read in uh, March was The Haunted Bridge by Carolyn Keene. This is a Nancy Drew mystery. <laughs> and I have to say, um, of all of the Nancy Drews that I have read over the past several years um because i have been basically collecting nancy drews anytime i can find them like secondhand in secondhand shops or in this case i found this in a thrift um store i haven't always like enjoyed them uh lately just because some of the stereotypes in there are just really ridiculous and i know that's a sign of the times honestly. Um, these are written for kids and it's just kind of how things are. Um, but it, it's just been a little bit silly uh, or not, not aging correctly. Yeah. Uh, that kind of thing in the books. Uh, the biggest, uh, thing that bothered me throughout them, honestly, has been, uh, George and Bess, who are Nancy's best friends. That is a thing that annoyed me has annoyed me the most over reading some of these older ones uh, is their interactions. When I was a kid I really liked George because she was like the tomboy and she was the go-getter and she was you know all ready for everything. Um, 
and I really liked her as a kid because, you know, as also a tomboy, also someone who was like, I'll freaking do stuff, even though I was definitely a coward, I would not have been down for adventure as much, to be completely honest. But that's what I was really, like, I thought she was really cool, but reading these first editions as an adult and seeing how she treats George, like, uh, seeing how she treats her cousin Bess, seeing how other people treat Bess, like, Bess is supposed to be pleasantly plump or whatever, and that is constantly, she's constantly ragged on for that, constantly ragged on for wanting to eat something, constantly ragged on for being legitimately scared because Nancy has like a one-track mind and keeps getting them into dangerous situations and Bess is of course uh rightfully worried. <laughs> Sometimes they're pretty dangerous people and the amount of times that Nancy has been like kidnapped, tied up, hit in the head, like the amount of times things have happened, I don't blame Bess for being a little more cautious because shit, this stuff is pretty scary sometimes. Especially when you're like 17, 18 years old and, you know, shit's scary. <laughs> oh, that was something that's been bothering me in some of those older ones, but this one had none of that. It was, it was so refreshing because it didn't have any of George ragging on Bess about how she looked and she barely even ragged on her about being scared. She got on her a little bit, but Bess actually was really brave in this book. It's actually the bravest Bess has been. And something that I will say for Bess that I feel like I've brought up before when I've been talking about these books is I thought she was annoying when I was a kid because she was always a scaredy cat. But I'm like looking at her now and really reading these, especially in this one. Yeah, she is a scaredy cat, but she's also incredibly loyal. And even though she is terrified, and even though she's very cautious, and even though she's basically like a Chucky Finster character of, I don't know you guys, this doesn't look so good. Like she loves her friends. She loves her cousin. She loves Nancy and she will do stuff anyway. And that's not being a coward. That's being brave. So yeah, I think Bess needs a lot more credit than she gets. This book is uh, basically Nancy, Bess, and George are away at this resort thing. They've been asked to go there t because Nancy's dad is working on a case and he may or may not want her to be involved. It involves like jewel thievery and stuff like that. Uh, so in the meantime, Nancy and her friends have been, just been enjoying the resort and playing golf because of course Nancy because she's the Mary Sue of everything and is amazing at whatever she puts her mind to. Uh, she ends up playing in a golf tournament and being really involved in a golf tournament and she's so talented you guys, crazily talented. And so there's like a subplot involved with Nancy like also being a part of this golf tournament, hurting her hand at one point and having to soldier on through the detective work in the golf tournament. And I actually really liked this volume as well because Nancy can be, like I said, a Mary Sue. She's a little bit annoying sometimes with how perfect she is at everything. But the good thing about these novels, especially this one, is that Nancy is pretty flawed though. She has, like I said, a one-track mind. Her main focus is crime solving. And that is what she is supremely focused on, sometimes to the detriment of her friends and other people involved. She's almost, in the way that people describe Sherlock Holmes as sometimes quite cold-blooded. She is almost kind of like that as well because she has no problem manipulating her friends into going along on adventures with her and especially Ned who's like completely besotted with her. She has no problem at all manipulating him into helping her and joining in on crazy things but I think the dude was just like 
hoping, hey, we're going to go out on a date and it becomes, hey, yeah, we're out on a date, but now we're going to like drive around chasing this car <laughs> kind of a situation, which I mean, if that is into you, what you're into, like if that's a green flag for you, go for it, bro. But it's just kind of, I don't know, it's just kind of funny. She, she is, despite the fact that she's got this whole like Barbie perfect at everything, whatever she sets her mind to thing, she also has, yeah, like this very one-track mind, almost cold-blooded attitude about I need to solve the shit and I will do whatever it takes to solve this case. Um, and especially in this one, like I said, she injures her hand at one point, but continues, continues to play golf, continues to investigate and do dangerous things, even though she's like, has a possibility of seriously harming her hand to the point of she might not be able to ever play sports again. She might not be able to have full usage of her hand. She just continues anyway, but she's crazy. So yeah, I, I really ended up liking this. Uh, there's a little bit of it that Dave said, but honestly not as bad as some of the others that I've read. Um, I gave this like four stars because like I said, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't absolutely fantastic. But as far as some of the others that I've read over the past couple of years, I think this is the best one that I've, I've read because I just really enjoyed, uh, seeing a little bit more of these characters in the way, seeing like differences in them. Like I said, George not being a complete shithead, Bess being considerably more braver, and Nancy, again, having such supreme flaws that were really in your face, basically. Uh, this one was published in 1937, so I call it pretty good for that time period, honestly. <laughs> that was what I read and what I didn't finish reading <laughs> in March, such as it was. Um, like I said, I had a little bit of a reading slump, been a little bit off and stuff. I'm okay. <laughs> so you should hopefully be seeing, um, more content from me. I know I kind of missed the previous week because just shit, but, um, yeah, I, I did some more brainstorming again, you guys, so hoping to continue on and being more consistent and having more energy overall because I know I've probably been a little bit off lately but it's okay uh anyway that was that was what I read uh, let me know ooh, as I throw my books uh let me know if you have read any of these if you enjoy any of these um if you don't enjoy any of these, it's fine too. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for always watching. If you are new here and would like to consider subscribing, please do so. And I hope you guys are having a great day, week, weekend, wherever you're at. And I will see you next time. Bye.